afternoon and welcome back to another Footy Consultancy podcast. Today we are very honoured to have with us Lee Nova, current Bradford City number no. 9, ex-Birmingham City, Huddersfield, Charlton Athletic and Scunthorpe. Good to see you Lee, how are you doing? Yes, yeah, good, thanks for having me. And understanding the minute you've been coming back from injury, how's that been? Yeah, it's been good. Um, had an up seven weeks ago. Um, it's been long, boring, but now it's getting there. I think I'm outside this week, so yeah, seen a bit of light at the end of the tunnel now. Have you got any games in mind where you think you might be back? Uh, I think we said the last four or five games, because um, at the start they probably thought I wouldn't play a part, but um, yeah, so the last four or five will be obviously ideal to get back to. Perfect, and before the injury, your season seemed to be going very well. I think you've scored, what's it, 6 and 12? Yeah, so I think all in all, about 7 and 40 in this season, um, but no, it was going well, and then pick up a little injury, or turn it into quite a bad one. And there's been a couple of times in your career I've noticed where you have had injuries that have kind of stopped that progression. Um, was it a hamstring injury? Was that it? Yeah. At Huddersfield? Yeah, I had a bad hamstring injury at Huddersfield. Um, I think it was literally just hung on by a, a little thread, which probably would have been easier for it to just come off so I could yeah. have it repaired, but that was about three months, yeah, so it's not been ideal. Um, this season as well, I had a bad cough injury. Yeah. Played, just had a tight cough and ended up getting it scanned and I'd, was out for about 10 weeks and then I think I played about five games come back and then picked up literally a knee injury. I think as a striker as well, momentum's key in confidence. How much do you think it plays a, <coughs> a role in momentum when you keep picking up injuries and little niggles here and there? Obviously, you've got players at the top end, like of Harry Kane, who seems to have, the last few years, had quite a few injuries that have knocked him back, but then he's came back and hit that run of form. Yeah, obviously, I think it's for any position. You need that run. You need that run in the team. You know, if you keep on them players keep coming in and out, it's not good for you. It's not good for your team as well because you need that sort of solidarity way in where you know who's going to do what and what's going to happen. But for me personally, it's obviously not ideal. Um, you know, I work hard. You know, tough for ten weeks yeah. and get back in the team and then something just woke up one morning, had a sore knee, went in, and obviously I need a knee operation. Um, but no, it's, to be fair, injuries part and parcel. It's more getting yeah. your head around how long it's going to be and working hard and doing everything you can to get back quicker. And, and you know, when you get your chance again, obviously taking it. Do you think, as you've obviously now you've been playing in the AFL for over 10 years, do you think that experience has helped to deal better with injuries? Yeah, uh, sort of, even sort of like when you said about chances and that, it's never bothered me missing a chance. Yeah. If I missed an open goal, I remember a game when I was on loan at Chesterfield, I missed an open goal. It didn't bother me, I wouldn't score 10 minutes later. I was yeah. just like, if I'm not getting them chance, I'll be worried. But yeah, obviously, playing around and being around the game and the characters help you deal with stuff. And probably when I was younger, I didn't take it as well yeah. with the injuries. And I thought, you know, what if the sign's someone else and I never play again? I'm not going to do this. But now you just sort of deal with it. It's part and parcel of your job. Yeah. And just, you just got to come back stronger. Like the mental side, is, you know, I've always been pretty good with that. Have you found that in the past or even now that you've had much support from the clubs when you have been injured in regards to the mental side of it? Um, I don't know. Obviously, the game's changing a lot now where yeah. the mental side is obviously at the forefront of everyone's mind with, you know, things that have gone on, you know, that you see the young lads, well, what's happened with them and... I would probably say now there's a lot more going around where there is help if you need, obviously with yeah. the PFA, you know, you can speak to people at the club, but for me personally, I, I've never really needed that help, I've just sort of got on with it and got my head around it, yeah. if, you know, I've always, if someone's telling me I'm going to be out for 10 weeks, I'll try and get back as quick as I can and do everything I can off the pitch as well as, you know, when I'm at the training ground to, to help improve that as well. I think when I've been speaking to other players and read articles and followed your career I think one thing you have definitely been associated with is that mindset your attitude on and off the pitch your hard work the resilience do you think that's helped you get to the levels that you play at? Yeah I think obviously it's been probably not your typical journey through an academy or things like that yeah. um, so probably the harder sort of upbringing in football maybe did help me and stuff and I wouldn't change anything what I've done you know, I've done things what people could only dream of and what yeah. probably I would never ever thought I would be able to do. And always when I started, I just want to play the highest level possible. If that was going to be the conference, if that was going to be the conference, if that would be it, I would give it me all. 
and obviously I went on to play a lot higher and you know I wouldn't change anything for that. There's a lot more highlighted now with the likes of Jamie Vardy's where people have come from non-league backgrounds, come from grassroots and came all the way through to the top so what I'd like to have a chat with you about was how your football journey started out you know what was it initially got into football and your, your journey beginning it was on boys club yeah obviously um, sort of you know, obviously the as we used to call it, the boys has changed yeah. now it's obviously not there anymore houses, but we're just sort of going there and playing the five side in the indoor court and then I think I went to trials and and I think I ended up playing like the year above myself for probably about a few years, four or five years. And then it was sort of went to Newcastle, I was playing Newcastle, Sunderland, Paul then all at the same time. So yeah. that time you could. And it was sort of like make a decision, end up staying Newcastle Walls and then it come down where you had to choose between the boys club and New, Newcastle and I ended up choosing the boys club. It was just for, I was enjoying it more, yeah. playing with friends, I was young. You know, it was just sort of probably at the time was the, the right decision, and not my age group. I think it was like Andy Carroll and stuff like that. Yeah. When the you know the career he's had, it's been unbelievable. But for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it the way that I've done it. Probably the hard way, sort of. You know, I, like you say, I was only in the academy for probably a couple of years when I was younger, um, and you know the hard work I've had to do was to get myself to that level. You know, it hasn't been easy. What do you think it is about Walls and Boys Club that's produced so many players? I've went on to play at the highest level. You know, you've got your, your standouts, Michael Carricks, and then even when you look down the divisions, you've got players from Walls and Boys Club all the way through. What do you think it is about that club that continues to produce these players? Obviously, a lot of it's got to be the coaching. Yeah. Um, the coaching I had, um, you know, I pretty much had the same manager the full time I was there. You know, Alan Jarvis, I think he still, still does a bit with, yeah. the, with the boys club now. But for me, it was like, it was more like a little family. It was it was crazy, obviously, going to Churchill, you know, festival thing that we used yeah. to go to. It used to be like the highlight of you being at the, at the club and that. But it was just sort of that mentality where... I'm playing for Wolves and like we're going to win we're going yeah. to steamroll you it was like didn't matter if we were playing top of the league bottom of the league we were going to win and you know I think at any job you need that and I probably took that with me through my career where I think you know I just want to do the best I certainly remember when I was younger playing in grassroots how there was that mentality about Wolves and Boys Club I played at the Boys are for years and years and years five a side and you know everybody would always think oh he plays for Wasn't Boys Club, he plays for Wasn't Boys Club. Mm-hmm. And it did have an aura about it. And I think that th- there was a kind of a psychological resilience that those players did have. Mm-hmm. And you see a lot of players did go on to be very successful from there who didn't necessarily play in the academy system. How do you think they prepared you for the transition into senior football? I don't know, it's just the enjoyment, just enjoying. For me, if you're not enjoying something, don't do yeah. it. If you're not enjoying playing football, stop playing. But for me, I loved every training session, going in, you, know, you were playing with your mates, yeah. you are sort of, everyone wanted to be at Wall's End, every kid who was my age wanted to be at Wall's End. First thing you go into school on Monday, oh, I see you won. So everyone knew what Wall's End had done. Yeah. But like you said, the players that brought through, like to Michael Carrick, obviously Steve Bruce, Shearer, it just had that like aura about it, like yeah. you said, and it was that, it was sort of a bit of an arrogance oh well, no one's going to come here and beat us where walls end and it sort of rubbed off not that every, not that we were arrogant as kids yeah. but it was like we don't want to get beat out we don't want to sort of embarrass the boys club and where we didn't put pressure on ourselves it was just sort of just enjoying it and enjoying winning and, and taking them trophies and, and things like that but there's definitely a winning mentality you know I think that's one thing that kind of goes under the radar now we talk a lot about developing the future players and developing resilience and developing them being humble but ultimately football is a game and you want to win <clears throat> and children as much as they need to be exposed to to losing for learning they also need to be exposed to winning and they need to have that mindset and that mentality and you know from an outsider looking in I was never fortunate enough to play for Wars and Boys Club at 11 aside just in the 5 aside but it was kind of oh there's the boys there's Wars End mm-hmm. And, you know, that psychological gains that they had, I think it gives you confidence. It did. It gave everyone confidence. You know, I think there was a lot of us at the time who were at the academy and I'm playing for them. So, 
we were sort of like we knew we were good enough. We we sort of like you said had that self belief. Yeah. That was sort of drummed in here, and you know believe like you're here for a reason kind of thing. And now we have players there who probably weren't as good, but they had that mentality where I was like, right, I'm not gonna win. I'm not gonna lose here. I want to be part of this and, and people always used to probably up the game as well playing yeah. against us which you know, we probably enjoyed as well So coming to 16 leaving school what were your choices? Um, I went to Monk Seton um, done the sort of had set up a little academy there yeah, um, which helped lads get in the pro game and play, played against pro clubs and the sort of set a link up with Gretna at yeah. the time where I think won the Scottish Championship but I remember playing Sort of game four, Monk Seton was a trial game against Mansfield, so they could have a look at us. And I ended up scoring five in the game. So I know. And it was like, oh, Mansfield want to take on trial. And at the time, I was probably a bit naive where I didn't know what I was getting into. Yeah. And I went down, I was living in a sort of B and B with some first team player I didn't even know. And I would say, oh, you're sharing with him, that's it, this is what you're doing. And it was just like, I probably didn't settle, I didn't have the right. Not that I didn't have the right mindset because I knew what I wanted to do, yeah. but it was that I didn't know what I was expecting. So that yeah. sort of never worked out. And I'd done that year and I ended up going to Gretna and done a year there and sort of the club basically folded. They got the SPL. Um, the end of that year, they basically said, oh, you, you're not getting a contract. And I think I'd scored something like 30 odd goals that season. It was like, all right, what, what more do I need to do? Yeah. Just like we ain't got any money. So I think we can't afford to pay you, you can stay, but you're not going to get paid. And I was like, I'm not doing that, I'm living away from home. So I ended up going home. And I remember the call come in. I think um, it was the manager at the time said, Oh, will you come back and play in the SPL? And I was just like, He was like, We'll give you a three, three month contract with a three month extension to January. I was just like, It's obviously big, so I was going to play yeah. against Salt Lake Rangers. And at the time, I'd been trained with Newcastle Blue Star with about five other lads who had come from Gretna. And it was the choice. They were going to play non league. Not the prettiest I don't want to play in the SPL. And for me, it was like, I want to go and play. I just want to play football. And yeah. Probably at that time, I wasn't ready to go and play SPL. I was 17, 18. I weren't ready. I probably would have went up there and not, not settled, not, yeah. not played. I would have been frustrated. So I ended up deciding just go and play non league. With friends get back and join football again and obviously it's worked out for the, the best There's a, we've spotted quite a few people have had a, a similar story in regards to 16 sent away got went into digs and have ended up coming back and playing non-league because it was kind of I don't know if it was they weren't prepared at 16 year old you've been living at home you've been either at a boys club or in an academy you know things are pretty settled and all of a sudden completely uprooted different part of the country you don't know anybody expected to be independent do you think there's more they can do to prepare these players to go in the digs I don't know obviously I don't know what it's like now with, you know you speak to a few young lads now with academies and who are in digs and you know they seem to be getting looked after like they would at home so yeah. maybe it's changed maybe it's, you know things have changed and looked at it and said you know we can't send players to these digs and sort of looking after yourself I just went weren't ready I just weren't yeah. it's 16 I probably wasn't ready to move away from home because I'd never been in the academy so for someone then to say oh we want to take you it's like I was preparing to go to sixth form yeah. so for me mentally I probably wasn't ready but then I had that mentality that I, I did want to become a professional footballer but obviously I was a lot later than the yeah. standard footballer so for me it was like Maybe said that when I was younger, they maybe could have done more. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, you see the academies now. I imagine yeah. they've got like everything set up for them, so they have no worries. Yeah, I think that um, it's been a big focus on youth development and how these with under twenty three's program now with the mm -hmm. Premier League two and things like that is. I think it is completely different from maybe even just ten years ago. Yeah. So you've made the decision, you've went to Gretna, things haven't worked out because of obviously what happened with the club, which again was a shock to everybody. Gretna, I think they went almost two or three years and beaten, just shut up the divisions yeah. and then overnight seemed to disappear. You've come back to Blue Star. How long was it before you went to Gated? Um, so I'd done that, excuse me, done that season and 
I think I scored like 20 odd goals but I was playing men's football at yeah. 17, 18 and I was you know mixing with men I was you know getting kicked which I, I probably needed to toughen myself yeah. up and I sort of I was on a contract which was very probably rare back in, at that level yeah. and I was on a, a decent contract for non-league and it was sort of asked you know I want to go and try and play higher and they said well we want money for you and it was just random a, a thing come up to go to Australia and they said oh you can go and mm-hmm. I went out there to Melbourne I think I was there two weeks I played in the trial game I think I scored a few goals in them and the club got wind of it and sort of a few clubs in England were sniffing around and they said that's what stupid money for that time at non-league yeah. so I ended up coming back so it was a short stint in Australia a long way to go for a trial game but I ended up coming back and I think that was in the August and September. I signed for Gator, and then three months later, I signed for Huddersfield. So it's every I'm, you know, I'm a big believer. Everything happens for a reason. And you know, a woman, I'm thinking I'm signing for some Australian team, and I'm back playing for Blue Star, and then you know, I get sold for three and a half grand late, <laughs> and then get sold obviously from Gator as well. So was that in League One, Huddersfield? Yeah, so Huddersfield were in League One at the time. I think there was a few. I remember going to training one Tuesday. And um, Ian Bogie at the time was the yeah. manager, and Jeff Wrightson, the assistant. I used to drive in with Jeff. He went, oh, I don't think you're training today, mate. He was like, I think a few clubs are bid for you, so the chem wants to see you. So I remember going in, and I was like, there with me boots, <laughs> like, you naive kid. And he was like, no, the chem wants to see you. I'm like, why? He was like, oh, I think at the time, Peter Brass, gone through, and there was, a, you know, a talk of Leeds were interested, and I was just like, I was like, I need to ring my mum. I need to ring my mum and dad. Yeah, so like, they shot across and had a meeting with the chairman. He was just like, look, we're going to sell you, but we want to sell you to Huddersfield. Um, they're going to loan you back. And at the time, I think it was sort of, I had to be loaned back, and it was 150 grand they were paying for us. But at the time, I'd, I'd just signed for Gated three months before for three and a half grand. So I was just like, wow. Well, like, so Did you have an agent? At that time, I just had. I had, no, it is. I sort of had an inkling that I was going to get a move because people will keep ringing us saying, yeah. oh, I'll represent you, I'll do this, I'll do that. And at the time, I was like, well, I'm just playing like, I'm playing football at Gator with my mates who obviously come close to because I've signed yeah. for. And then I end up signing like with some guy and it was probably the worst decision I've ever done in my life. If I could change anything in my career, I would be never ever the same with that guy again because he absolutely ripped the eyeballs out of me. And obviously, I was young, naive. And thinking, yeah. I've got an agent, this and that. And my mum and dad and stepdad didn't know anything at the time. Yeah. So I was like, well, if I go on I can't take my mum. You know I mean? I'm not going to yeah, walk yeah. in and, and sort it into the club. And my mum's holding my hand. <laughs> She's not going to negotiate a deal. So I was like, I need an agent. And this one guy just stood out. Don't know. He obviously probably talked the best game possible, yeah. but looking back I should never ever have done it and that's probably I never ever have regrets but looking back on my career that's only regret yeah. and the guy who I was going to sign with I ended up sign, like signing with about I think it was a couple of years later and I was with him for years and years and then he ended up retiring so but you know I see lads now with agents when they like 14, 15 I'm like you don't need one no you don't need one because that agent will tell you everything you want to hear yeah when really stuff that you already know there's no need years ago it used to be was, was it the PFA it used to represent players yeah so the PFA obviously represented players so at that time I didn't know if I didn't have an agent they would have sent a representative yeah. for, for me but obviously I'd never been in the pro game I wasn't a member of the PFA I didn't have you know anything like that so I was just a young naive who was basically getting told you're going Huddersfield and I suppose these agents aren't going to tell you that because they want to get their bit out of it as well yeah so you know he's doing it for one reason because he wants to get paid and I imagine he got a nice little pay from the club and no at the time he was taking money from me out of my deal what I just thought was normal I didn't know anything about that and then when come to to the end of the deal and I signed with this other guy and he was just like this ain't normal mate he's like he's took money off you what should have been coming from the club and yeah. stuff like that so when you look back but for me it was just a learning curve I sort of don't jump in too foot and I think it's a massive bit of advice to be fair because there will be young lads out there and young girls that are being approached constantly about representation and mm. you know what is the best thing to do and I suppose 
they could probably ring the PFA and ask for advice on this. 100%. Um, at the time, like I said, I didn't really know. I'd never really heard of the PFA. I'd never been yeah. part of the PFA. I'd never been in an academy at you know, 14, 15, 16, so I didn't know about this. But obviously, if I know now what I knew then, then I wouldn't have signed it. Things different. Yeah. So you got your, the move to Huddersfield and they loaned you back to Gateshead. Was Clark at Huddersfield at the time? Yeah, so Lee Clark signed me, so obviously... <laughs> Uh, I remember going down and going down and it was obviously I was meeting this agent down there and met Lee Clark, Terry McDermott, Derek Fazagli and uh, Paul Stevenson. We all had stuff in common and it just yeah. clicked straight away. Obviously Lee and, and Paul were from sort of the same area I was yeah. brought up. So and, and Steve I actually knows some of my family so it was a bit we had and it, it, it was just class like from obviously I'm sat in front of the office like in front of my hero like yeah. who I watch but then getting to work with him it, it was class and he just said like you know part of the deal is you, you're going back we want you to play we're going to keep an eye on you you train you a few times a week and, and it was class it probably toughened me up as well because I got to still play at a high level for yeah. my age but then I still got to train I was coming back training with sort of ex-Premier League players like David Unsworth and stuff like that who I quickly realised like I need to toughen up otherwise I ain't yeah. going to be ready for this when I go in the pre-season. And you had a, a prolific season at Gateshead. Yeah, so I think um, I think I scored 30 odd goals that year, which was max. I didn't score, I think, for the first five or six games. Mm-hmm. And obviously going to the new club, you want to hit the ground run. Yeah. I always remember this one game we were on the bus, I think it was against someone like Vauxhall Motors or something like that. We were playing and Bogue said at the time, he was like, don't worry, you'll score. It'll just come in off your backside, it'll just yeah. roll and it'll stay. And that's literally what happened. Someone shot, come back with the keeper, hit me on the back of the leg and went in. And I think the next week I scored nine in a week. That's and it was just bad, like, all right, I, I need to keep going. Yeah. And I think probably that belief, what they put in me, like yeah. Bogues and Jeff from such a young age, was obviously massive for me. And like playing with good players as well, because obviously I stepped up. And like in Newcastle Blues, so like I played with Robbo. Yeah, and Robbo was probably head and shoulders above me obviously he's all that but his ability was obviously a lot more than mine and like I just thought like I'm not ready mm-hmm. sort of for that pro game obviously looking at Robbo who I'd been yeah trying been at that your... level and probably I was young probably I need to be stronger mentally physically and work on stuff and probably until I went to Gator I didn't believe that could 100% get that level. I yeah. always thought in the back of my head, I'm, I'm good enough, but deep down I probably had them doubts. But once I got a gate set, I thought, I'm not letting this slip now. And then I knew if clubs were watching me because of the agents ringing. Yeah. So it was a case of, right, I need to keep working hard and keep keep doing what is getting people to watch me. And then, like I said, I scored nine in a week. And I think the next, I think one of the games I scored five. I scored like the quickest hat rig in non-league history. So I think it was like under three minutes at the time. And I think that's when people, that's more than when I start to believe that I'm yeah. good enough, I can go and play at this level. And I had sort of lads I, I was travelling in with at the time, like Chris Gate and Chris Baxter, who I've been at Newcastle for years. And they were like, you know, you're good enough, like you'll get a move. And obviously with Jeff and the things that speak to you and you, you sort of half take it in. And then when obviously you, you see the club's bidding for you, like, right, this is real now. And obviously I went to Huddersfield and I remember in pre-season I scored seven in pre-season my first pre-season and I remember the gaff at the time Lee, Lee Clark mm-hmm. pulled me and saying oh this isn't going to be like Gator you're not going to play every game and I was just like you know for all I want to do is play football Yeah. and he was like but we're not going to let you go on loan we're going to keep you here because I think at the time they were League 1 fancy to get promoted yeah. so I think there was teams in League 2 in conference who wanted to take me and he was like you're not going I was just like all right, okay. And I thought, well, if I'm not going to play, I need to do something. So yeah. I thought, I'm going to work on, and I just work non-stop after training and, you know, week four to finish in. Still to this day and hour, always, if there's finishing to be done after training, I'll be yeah. there, I'll be the, you know, sort of front of the line and I need to toughen up as well. So I, I remember going to the fitness coach at the time, Steve Black, and saying I need to get stronger. And I worked with him one-on-one for months to get stronger, but, the conversation will really sort of put things in pers- like perspective for me for well I've come here to play I'm going to play I'm not bothered if I've come from non-league yeah. I'm going to play and end up scoring seven that pre-season then 
I think sort of the first game was on the bench we were getting beat 2-0 and he said oh you're going on and for me I was fourth fifth choice striker at the time and we ended up drawing 2-2 and I played a massive part and then the Tuesday I started in the cup done well and it's sort of like a snowball effect just kept believing and believing yeah. I thought I deserve to be here so I'm, I want to play and I ended up becoming like me and Jordan Rhodes sort of just hit it off and had this partnership and the lads who were probably on mega money more than what I was on were on the bench mm-hmm. and that's when sort of for me I believed that I deserved to be at that level and I had that mentality where I wouldn't bother no one was going to get me shirt if I'd done something wrong I'd work hard if I was having a bad game no matter what I'd always work hard Jordan Roses went on to have a, a pretty good career as well what was it like with that partnership? It was it was weird because we had never ever played together. Yeah. During the whole of pre-season, we never played together. It was sort of because I was like probably four fifth choice. I was like getting ten minutes for the first team, yeah. going playing for the reserves with a young lad, and it just sort of clicked. Remember, we played. I think we played Southampton, and it, we won three 0 And literally everything we done just worked. We read where each other were going. Yeah. And from there, it literally. It, it was just one of them things. And how did that partnership work on the pitch? Was it was he more of a target man and you would play off him and do a bit more of the running or was it kind of you both would do a similar Yeah, role? both just similar. You know, I, I think the key, sort of the keeper at the time knew if you kicked to one of us, the other one would be sort of yeah. playing off and vice versa. And it was just like that. And we were close off the pitch as well. So I think yeah. that helped as well. You hear that a lot. I think you see it with um, Andy Cullen, Dwight. Dwight York, they were like that. Mm-hmm. We just clicked. Going back to when you're talking about with Bogues and then going over to Huddersfield, how much importance do you think the likes of Ian Bogie played in giving you that confidence that helped you get to that next level? Massive. Like, because obviously at the time I was playing, I think it was classes like the Unibond. Yeah. So it was sort of, you know, a few levels above the sort of Northern League is now. And so when I spoke to him he said come here enjoy it we play good football you'll score goals and obviously I didn't score goals straight away Yeah. but he still believed he had players there that, that had done it for him mm-hmm. and who at the time were probably better physically developed and probably better players but I just thought you know what it is he showed me back and I'm just going to work hard and I didn't work at the time so it was like how can I get better and I, you know, I worked hard in the gym you know, I sort of worked on stuff up I need to improve on yeah. it. Like I said, I got the look of the, where once went in off my backside and so the, that just set the ball rolling but Bogues and Jeff were like a massive like, confidence booster for me as well. And these people must have seen something in you when you consider you were, <coughs> Gretna seen something that you wanted to come back and play in the SPL. Ian Bogey, one of the most experienced guys out there in the North East, he's seen some of Tina at Gateshead and then the Terry McDermott and Lee Clark who who have both played at the highest possible level mm-hmm. to see something in you. So even when you didn't have that massive confidence <coughs> in yourself at first, they've seen something in you. Did they ever see what it was, what they've seen in you, what they thought was your, your strongest assets? Obviously, it, the strike that's got to be finishing. Yeah. I mean, sort of no coincidence that Blue Star scored 20-odd goals. Yeah. And when the gate had the level, a few levels above, scored 30-odd. And then first level, first season at Huddersfield, I think I scored you know, 14, 15 from the lad who come from sort of the conference north. It, it was obviously massive. So I think as well that it just worked hard. Like if mm-hmm. I knew, I remember like when I when I was saying about when I was at um, Gates and I used to train with Huddersfield sometimes. Yeah. And there'd be like, sort of, I remember the first session I had David Unsworth and Chris Lachetti the two centre-backs I was playing against played in the Prem all the career yeah. and I went to spin in behind they just blocked me I was, I was literally like a little baby trying to get past them and I thought I need to be stronger and I need to do this so I literally all that from January to sort of June when we went back I just worked and worked in the gym I mm-hmm. ended up going a few kilos sort of heavier back what, and what they told me to do and it was like I need to be at the front of this running so I had that mentality where I wanted to be at the front but yeah. I wanted to be noticed so whether they've seen that hard work and obviously dedication as well so 
It's all because a non-league player's probably got that tag, loves a drink, loves yeah, this, yeah. loves a night out, oh, we're going to have to keep eye on him. But I was, I was obviously young yeah. as well for playing that level, so it wasn't the case of that. I just literally wanted to be a pro footballer. How old were you when you went to Huddersfield? I think I signed when I was 19, I think. Yeah. So I was so still very young. So I was young in football terms, but I was getting at that age where I needed to make a decision yeah. what I was going to do. Was I going to get sort of become a footballer or get a job? And I remember that I was with Chris Gay, like I said, who we drove in with, and he had just signed up for a personal training course. And I was like, I think I need to do something like this. So yeah. I remember getting all the information. And then two weeks later, I went to went to St. Fordersfield for, at the time, a non, non-league record fee of 150 grand. So it was just sort of, I think time is a massive thing for me, but, you know, I say hard work all the time for me. That's, I still use that to this day. Yeah. Is there anything that, because you've had, let's see, you've had a very good season this season so far until the injury. Is there anything that if you could go back and tell your 19-year-old self now, that the advice you would give him? Don't say with that age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Nah. Do you know what it is? I never look back on my career with regrets. Yeah. Because I've done stuff, I've played at Wembley, I've been promoted. Probably the worst case would be getting relegated in a season. Yeah. But, you know, I never ever want to look back on my career. I never ever want to look back and blame someone else. Yeah. I never want to be one of them lads that say, I could have done that, I could yeah, have done if, this. Yeah. Because I know loads of lads, oh, I could have been that, I could have done this. Well, why didn't you? But I think you've taken responsibility for that. It's probably what's taking you to the level that you're at. Um, there's a, we do live in a society where there's an excuse culture mm-hmm. there's so many people you say oh I had trials here oh, I could have yeah. done this I could have done that well the reality is and this is something that Chris Wilder said as well you didn't do that exactly so either put up or shut up exactly for me it was like I said I, I never look back and I have regrets apart from that one what yeah. I said but football in terms I don't have so any, on the pitch no regrets never sort of never Never look back and thought, I wish I'd done that differently. I wish I'd have done that. Maybe sometimes when clubs have been interested at a high level, I probably could have pushed things. Yeah. And being that bit of a bad egg, but it's just not in my nature to do that. Yeah. So I'm not going to change who I am and where I've come from, just sort of do that. Probably maybe there's a couple of times where I've been told you need to go in and do this. But when you're younger and you, you've come from the level I've come at, I'm not wanting to go and so on, bang on the man just on, say, yeah. I want this, I want, I want to go here. Probably appreciate it a bit more. Yeah, because you've had definitely. to work that a bit harder for it. Yeah, obviously the level that we were at, it was take a pack lunch of the game. Yeah, have stop off. You know, I remember I come back from non-league games last while I'm cans on the back of the bus, yeah. and that was that non-league mentality of a player where I wasn't sort of that normal non-league mentality. Yeah, where I wasn't having a can, I was probably sitting with like a water or something like yeah. that, which is you know at the time probably lads. So look at that we had all, but. Because I was the odd one out, not odd that I didn't get on. I got on great with yeah, everyone. Yeah, you had a different mentality. Well, I, way yeah, my be. mentality was different. Everyone else is where I'd be like, I don't want to do that. I want to get out of this club. I want to leave there. I sort of had that selfishness where I think every player needs that, yeah. no matter what age or where you've got to look after yourself as well. But you need to know that you're doing everything for your team as well. Because I've seen quite a bit with what I've done over the last few years and. With Robbo, mm-hmm. we were fortunate to win the, the National Cup, the National Schools Cup, a couple of years ago with the under 18s lads. Mm-hmm. And we had such a talented group of players. But I see a lot of players where I say it's 16, 17, I think, you know, they've still got a chance. Mm-hmm. If they get their head down and they get in the non league yeah. and they make their way, sort of way back up, they've got a chance. And then you, you bump into them a couple of years later and they're like, oh, I don't play anymore. Uh-huh. And I just, and I think, you know, you're not as far away from it as what you think. And sometimes we hear whispers at the certain clubs looking at the lads in the mm-hmm. non-league and the lads don't find out and they'll kind of, in the, as I say, the next, before you know it, they're kind of like, oh, it wasn't for me anymore. I got a job and I wanted to do yeah. this and want to do that. But I suppose there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make if you want to try to get to the very top. Yeah, there is. Obviously, it's a job everyone wants. Yeah. And it's probably the hardest job to keep yeah. because there's always someone wanting to take your place. Yeah. Imagine there's some someone in that my team. If I get back and get back in the team, they're gonna be one of the team my place. But for me, it was like I didn't want to be one of them lads. Yeah. But like, oh, I had trials here, I had trials there. So what? You didn't do it. Exactly. No one. You can't. If you're not good enough, you're not good enough. But never blame someone else for 
for me, I never want to look back and say, oh, it was his fault I didn't go there. It was his fault I didn't do this. I just want to take responsibility for me, my career, that I can look back whenever I finish, if that's, you know, now, <laughs> if it's in five years' time, yeah. and have no regrets. I just didn't want to be one of them lads from the area I've come from and all lads there who probably had more ability than me. Yeah. But, you know, I seen Robbo's bit the other day where he said that his ability was up here, but his mentality was down here. Yeah. Where I had ability, but my mentality was up here where I thought no one's going to take the opportunity away from me where, like where Lee Clark said, oh, you're not going to play much. And I was like, sort of had that where I was, well, I, I am going to play yeah. and I'll prove you wrong. And I ended up getting in the team a couple of weeks later and I was playing against sort of Southampton. Because I think an example that I often use is I'm a Wars End lad. You know, I went to, I went to Burnside, so a couple of years above me, I had Michael Carrick. Mm -hmm. And... Don't get us wrong. Those that say, oh, Michael Carrick, he was, yeah, he, he got to the very top, he wasn't great. He was, he was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. He was a standout player, but never once when I saw him play when I was younger that I think he's going to go in the Champions League, yeah. he's going to play for England and Man United. Mm -hmm. And even when he first went to West Ham, you know, you watched him play and I thought, oh, he's a good player, he's a good player. And then he went to Spurs and then he got better and better and better. And I think that mentality and you can tell he's the type of person that he's lived the right life. Mm -hmm. He's lived the footballer's life. <coughs> you know, he's never been in the in the limelight. He seems to have always been the best physical shape he can be in. He's very disciplined. And I think a lot of people can look at that as in, and kind of think, you know, there is a pathway there, but I've got to really, really want it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I see my mates going out at the weekend, I've got to say to myself, well, their intentions are different than mine. Uh, I can't go out with you. Yeah. You know, I've got football this weekend. You know, I can't have a drink tonight. I've got training tomorrow. And about making them sacrifices. And I don't, I don't think it's easy. I think there's a lot of PR pressure as well. You do, obviously, because your mates have got so-called normal jobs. Yeah. Where you're not in that normal industry, that, as people say. But for me, it was being selfish. I was like, well, you know, I've, I've seen where mates are brown. Oh, we're going to town. Are you coming? I say, well, no, I've got a game Tuesday. Yeah. So it's sat there. It's like, well, yeah, but it matters for me. It's my job. I turn up Tuesday and I have a bad game. I, I may not get back on that team. Yeah. So what's having that, like like you said, like Carrick, like where you probably do cut yourself off a bit from your friends. And, yeah. But if the proper friends, they'll understand. Yeah. And, and for me, I've got a small group of friends who were, I literally would trust my life with, yeah. who've been there from the start and who understand. And, if I said, oh, I'm not drinking tonight, they'd be like, all right, that's fine, like, it doesn't matter. But then you do get some who are, oh, like, is it in football terms, oh, he's a busy guy and he won't, he won't have a drink. Like, yeah. just have a drink, relax, and say, well, I can it, this is my job, this is what I'm getting paid for. And I thought, like, obviously come from non-league as well, it was like, I need to change that sort of yeah, non-league mentality. mentality and have that professional side where I sort of did change it, everything, changed my diet, everything like the way I done things and the way I looked out on obviously for books I'd never been involved in a pro club yeah. so for me it was like is this really what happens so I need to change my ways to obviously adapt to this as well which I think obviously you know to this day I still use how much of a role in support did your parents play huge um obviously from starting at a young age from the boys club you know like when you start out with your dad yeah you know my dad stepdad Step that drive me to obviously every every session, every game, yeah. every all over Newcastle. So they've been huge and they're still huge to this day. You know, I still I mean dad's probably the biggest critic if I don't score, are you in score today? <laughs> yeah, but I set up to now, but you in scored. It's just like it's always gonna be like that. Yeah. Where my mum and stepdad are probably the softer side, my dad's the harder side, which you know I've got which I like. Yeah. And I would always want someone to be honest with me and my brother-in-law's the same. He obviously played for Shields as well. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I thought you'd done well there. You should have scored though. Which I like. I, I don't I don't want to be someone yeah. one who... You don't want to be wrapped in cotton Yeah, ball. literally, if, if if I've had a bad game, I know I've had a bad game, but if you said that, I'd take it. Like, it does bother I me. suppose as well, you know, it helps build resilience, but I also think it's about how people give you that feedback. Mm -hmm. How they critique you. Yeah. I think it's okay critiquing somebody um, if you're coming from an educated side of the critique where you can see them, but you understand the game, you can see, oh, what happened in that point? They can have a conversation. I think some players go the opposite way where they can't handle the critique. I think my mum was probably the worst where 
still this day it doesn't bother me it can, I'm never ever going to please anyone yeah. I can't please everyone I could score I remember scoring a hat trick in a game but someone said oh you should score four I've just scored a hat trick yeah there's always going to be somebody and like at the start I would say probably because I sort of went from here and ended up going up yeah my sort of mum couldn't deal with it. it was like oh someone's writing this I was like don't read it yeah I'm not bothered like still this day people will be writing rubbish about me and I do not care literally hand and heart do not care what people think because in my head I know I'm good enough and I know if I miss a chance I'll yeah. get another one and I will score well you've proven it already you know yeah. you've played at the highest standard really and you know what he's achieved at Huddersfield I think Clark had an amazing season there you know when he's got promoted and then you've went on to Birmingham City and have a massive club what was that like? it was huge it was it was probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make in yeah. football in football in terms because I'd got offered a new deal at Huddersfield and obviously Lee got the job at Birmingham yeah and he, he obviously rang and said I know you have a contract I want to sign you and he had a massive influence on my career he probably yeah. shaped the way my career would go because he'd had, he took the chance from non league because it was a big chance because no one knew which way it was going to go because you see players now where they go in and they just drop back in non league and yeah. I didn't want to be like that so and sport, especially if like a club the size of Birmingham it's huge and that massive. opportunity ain't going ain't gonna to come up like often so I just thought you know what I, I want to do it and looking back I had a great time first season there I finished top scorer yeah and not many players can say that and probably from there Lee lost his job yeah. Gary Brown would come in and I just wasn't for him yeah which is fair enough he told me that which, but at the time my wife was heavily pregnant we were first child and, and I was just like what do I do he said I, I remember the conversation he was like Millwall have come in on loan for you Miss was like eight months pregnant. Yeah. I was like, I can't go. And they, I told him the, the situation. He was like, don't go. He said, do not go. He's like, stay here, train my bus. Yeah. So you can, when we're not playing. He, but then it's sort of, we had to sort of got back in the fall. Yeah. And then January coming, I was sort of back out again. So I ended up going to Chesterfield on loan, which he like forced and helped me do. And yeah. the way Birmingham helped, obviously Chesterfield weren't going to pay a lot of me wages and Birmingham helped with that. Yeah. So, for that, it was massive for me. So even, you know, a new manager comes in, you're not his cup of tea, but he still supported you through, you know, what you were going through with, with childbirth with your wife and you didn't really want to move down to London. It was a big deal. And did that mean a lot to have a manager support, even though you knew in the back of your head, I'm not his cup of tea, but he's still going out of his way to help us? Yeah, like, he was just honest. And I think anyone in any way of life 